Hi, it's Des here. I'm in Denver in Colorado. I'm at Convolgo 2019. I have the pleasure of being joined by Abhijit Chenoy, who's a founding engineer at Hedvig. Abhijit, great to see you. Thanks for making time to catch up with me. Thank you so much, Des. Now, you've had an exciting couple of days already. You've had uh, some stuff on the floor where you've been doing presentations, some one-on-ones, some one-to-manys. Um, firstly, congratulations on a great event. It's exciting. Thank you. Uh, how's it been the last couple of days? Uh, what's, what are some of the fun things you've been doing up till now? So it's been very exciting. Uh, as you, as everyone knows, uh, Commvault has acquired Hedwig. Now we are a part of the Commvault family. Indeed. So I've been very busy talking to Commvault customers, and I see that they're really excited about containers and what we offer in terms of containers. So yeah. I had some very, very good technical discussions with customers and partners of Commvault as well, and everyone seems to be very excited and is eager to actually try out yeah. Hedwig in containers and even in virtualization in general. Indeed. Well, let's get into that. I mean, it was exciting to see the two uh, uh, CEOs yesterday on stage uh, uh, very jovially sort of getting along and going backwards and forwards on the success story of the acquisition mm -hmm. and I guess the, the blinging of the two cultures of the organizations and the, the, the birds of a feather in many ways of uh, sort of this meeting of minds that two organizations have now become one in one. But I see had to be becoming sort of a brand in, inside the organization, still having its own, uh, I guess, culture and shape and feel in many ways, but also being able to leverage what, uh, uh, I guess, the, the two decades that Commvault brings to the table without losing its persona. Um, so containerization, I guess, you know, there's a natural progression towards cloud, cloud first, uh, uh, refactoring code if you own the code or getting third party applications are being refactored and become cloud native, they're, they're containerized, they run in a DevOps and orchestrated way. Um, so maybe just give us a bit of a summary on kind of your journey towards containerization as an organization and where you saw the opportunity in the market. So over the past uh, few years or maybe up to a decade, what we have been seeing is applications tend to become more and more distributed or yeah. networked, right? So what that has led to is large monolithic applications are no longer large monolithic applications. Right. They, are, they are slowly transforming into small or agile microservices. Yeah. So microservices is the new word that yeah. everyone tends to use these days, right? Now, the good thing about microservices is it lets you, as an application developer, to actually focus on a key component or a key function of the application that yeah. needs to be scaled, and you can scale just that, right? right? So you don't really have to scale the entire application to actually kind of improve the scalability of a particular component yeah, of the application. Yeah. So that's what containers enable you to do, right? So with, with that, we see that people are gradually moving from virtual machines, which tend to be, you can think of virtual machines as heavyweight containers, or yeah. you can think of containers as lightweight virtual machines, however you want to think about it. So we can see a gradual shift from people uh, running VMs to people running multiple containers for the same application. So that's the kind of progression that we are seeing. So when we started off, uh, so I've been in Hedwig since 2014, mm -hmm. early 2014, right? So at that time, the drive was towards virtual machines. Containers were yeah. still very, very new. It was early right? days. So it's very early days for Kubernetes and even Docker. Yeah, right? So yeah. uh, what we have seen is we have progressed from that time to now where people are actually wanting to use us directly with containers mm -hmm. and not try, try us out for virtual machines right. and run containers. Right? So uh, that's the reason even us as Hedwig we have gradually, we have kept track of this growth or yeah. this progression from virtual machines to containers and we try to actively build tools to help developers uh, deploy their applications yep. uh, using Hedwig on containers. I imagine in many ways, uh, I mean, you use it internally for your own development purposes, you use it as a platform for your own product to offer services, as you said initially, in potentially virtual environments. And it was just a, probably a, an obvious transition to then extend into other people's environments where they were containerizing things. Um, I remember, I think it's Randy Bias came up with the phrase that uh, in virtual machines and physical machines, we used to treat everything like pets. We'd build them up and feed them up and then hug them and kiss them and hope they didn't die. Yep. With the containers, we, we treat them like cattle. We, we instantiate them, we let them do the work and we kill them. And exactly. we don't really care, we're not emotionally attached to it because it's the configuration. Um, with the early days of, of the, the transition to containerized apps and refactored code and, and that shifted the sort of the Kubernetes world of orchestrated automated environments, what were what was some of the early experiences you had with that? What were some of the early environments you, you went into? I imagine that you've got some key verticals that, that were low hanging fruit that you went into where either development shops or very agile environments where it was a, a key clean fit. Have you got any examples that you can share with that where it's like, you know, that just makes sense, let's let's go into that first. Yeah. So 
as people started moving from virtual machines to containers, they initially, uh, the initial focus was to test out stateless applications, mm -hmm. right? They just wanted to make sure that the application runs fine, right? Yeah. W without first directly moving all their stateful applications. So uh, the, the transition that we have seen is as Hedwig, when we integrate with any container-based ecosystem, first, the first, uh, Rather, technology that became popular in the container world was Docker, and yeah. it's still growing, yeah. right? So, with Docker, you had a container engine. You can containerize your application and run it as a Docker container, yeah. right? So that Docker solved the problem of containerizing your application, right? Now, the more applications you containerize, the more management overhead you have. So you needed a system that mm, could also mm. help you manage containers, and that's where Kubernetes comes into the picture, yeah. right? Then that's that's how Kubernetes has gained popularity yep. as if well. A, if an instance dies, Kubernetes notices, reinstantiates exactly. it, yes. and tracks it, right? Yeah. So and alerts you. Exactly. So that that solves the problem of container orchestration, if yeah. I were to phrase it that way. So. If you consider a stateful application, so let's think about Docker first, right? So how did Hedwig integrate with Docker? So we developed our own Docker driver. Yep. So if when you're running a containerized stateful application in Docker, Docker uh, would ask the Hedwig Docker driver for a persistent volume, we would give it to it, and the right. container would use it, right? So that's That was the first integration yep. into the container ecosystem. And that's, that's the instantiation layer from an API request comes in, from whatever you know, microservices environment you've got, says, I want some capability, it says yes. I need some storage for it, it then reaches out to your API and says, instantiate storage in an ecosystem for that, and I'll put some network and compute around it, yep. and then it delivers the service, right? Yes, the the value add that Hedwig brought to the table, because there was only there's only one way to develop a Docker driver, because there's a Docker interface is well yep. defined, yep. every vendor would do it the same way. Yep. But the value add comes in with what we, what, the, what attributes can, we can associate with the volumes that we provide, right? right? With Hedwig, you can, you can associate or you can enable encryption, deduplication, compression, right. multi-site replication, yeah. everything with a Docker volume. And they're right? the game so, changers. Exactly, they're the game changers. So that's what we yeah. bring to the table. So that was our early integration into Docker. And as we spoke about Kubernetes, with Kubernetes, the whole ball game changes. Now you have a platform which can manage and deploy containers, right? right. So with Kubernetes, uh, we have a different integration, a more tighter integration which is native to Kubernetes into its own persistent volume okay. framework, right? So in Kubernetes, as you know, everything is uh, DevOps focused or application yeah. focused. Everything has to be self-service, API mm -hmm. driven, programmable. Yep. That's 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 the motto behind yep. Kubernetes, if I were to put it that way. Absolutely. And if you think about Hedwig, we bring the same, uh, the same philosophies or the same right. ideologies to the table. So even we are self-service, API driven, programmable, yep. right? So it's a natural fit. So with Kubernetes, uh, bringing that to the table, we for Kubernetes specifically, we have a dynamic provisioner that is there, mm -hmm. and its whole job is when the application developer says, give me a volume of size, yep. whatever, 10 gigs, or even a terabyte or a yep. petabyte, doesn't matter to us, right? We can scale. The dynamic provisioner for Hedwig is able to seamlessly talk to the underlying Hedwig cluster and give you that volume, right? right. All, all with just Cube APIs. Yeah, yeah. That's about it. Well, I think know? that's the key thing is that exactly. from a programmer's point of view, it's just an, it's an API, an endpoint for a service delivery. Yep. I can now focus on the business logic and exactly. and the models able to work with the data yep. work. I don't need to worry about infrastructure. It's yes. just a it's just a, a point. Yeah. I think that's a, the big game changer because even in virtual environments, you've still got to think about how much hardware have I got behind it? Can I run this sized VM? How many of those can I run? How long will it run for? Am I going to saturate memory? Am I running out of compute? In this case, the background does it all. You're just requesting a service and runs. And I imagine that with the instantiation of it, when it runs, also when it's no longer required, it'll shut itself down uh, and also protect the data in that it'll, it'll uh, as you said, dedupe it, encrypt it, decrypt it, and replicate it and move it to where it needs to be. Yes, and not only that, and even when we talk about uh, data sovereignty, when we talk about GDPR, compliance, yeah. things like that, right? Even those policies can be just driven through your programming, right. right? So you don't have to come to the Hedwig cluster and say, for this particular volume, ensure that the data only resides within this geography, yeah. right? You can even program against that. So right. you can you can create a storage class in Kubernetes and say, for this any volume created with this, I want my data to reside just in ge this geography right. and just forget about it and let Hedwig do the work for you. So that's what we bring to yeah, the yeah. table. It, there's an interesting, interesting thing that comes out of that in my mind, that is that traditionally when we think about infrastructure, it all sits under a CIO and they, they're very carefully protected on a balance sheet as to how many dollars they invest and what the ROI is and, and, and how they burn that down and get their value back and it might be a sunk cost that runs for three to five years. Mm -hmm. 
in this sense, it, it seems to me that you've sort of taken that typical cloud model of pay as what you use and pay as you go and scale as you go, where developers or people building infrastructure now, it's really software-defined infrastructure and software-defined networking. Now you've got software-defined storage yep. with all the capabilities. So you've met the market demand for that agility, that flexibility, but also cost effectiveness, because now people deploying and designing on the solution get all those things you're talking about, but only pay for what they use. Yep. That must be another uh, uh, eureka moment where people go, oh, okay, that's going to change our whole environment, but also they don't have to keep running to these CIOs saying, we have another rack of infrastructure, another data center. Um, you potentially, you know, it can be within the team saying, well, we've got this available infrastructure, I'm going to consume it, or it's telling me. Um, are there any things that have come out of that where clients you're working with have sort of come back and said, oh, we didn't expect it to happen, this is, this is magic, how did you make it or why did you make it? I mean, you must have some great stories where people have a little eureka moment like that and come back to you going, oh my God, that's fantastic. Yeah, so the good thing about, uh, about I'm again going to talk about specific to containers because yeah. that's, that's our theme here. So with Hedwig, you can start with as little as three nodes and expand to, there's, we don't really have any yeah. limits, but we have, we have tested everything uh, up to a thousand nodes, all our algorithms. Right. No one has gotten there, but uh, our biggest deployment is in terms of hundreds of nodes, yep. but we have tested up to a thousand, of, thousand nodes, right? Yep. So with Kubernetes and with this deep integration, you can assign policies which are very specific to applications, right? So right. if you know that an application data is going to lend itself well to dedupe, turn on dedupe, right? right? And we have right. global deduplication, yep. right? So to give you some examples, so, We've had some customers who, who as you said, like you go to the CIO provision, you 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 spec out a storage for let's say yep. x terabytes or x petabytes, and you don't know whether your data is going to dedupe well or not. Yep. And then you you go ahead with Hedwig, enable deduplication, and you see that you get very good deduplication in right. virtualized right. environments. Right? That's that's a bang for the buck right there. Yeah, yeah. Right? That's that's the kind of scenarios that we have seen, and. Uh, more than that, we also bring a lot of flexibility to the table because we let users choose policies very specific to the application. Right. You don't have to choose policies at a cluster-wide level or a system-wide level because if, for example, if you're not going to, if you don't need encryption for an application, yeah. if you're just yeah. running a DevOps application, you don't need uh, a policy at the system level that just enables encryption for everything. Right. right? So those are the things that we bring to the yeah. table. I, and, and you've got pre-built policies like recipes in many ways in my mind and that I don't have to actually have a lot of experience and knowledge around storage or even deduplication and encryption and so forth. I just know that I want the service and you've already got that capability yes. built in small, medium, large type t-shirt size capabilities and I can just choose what I want, right? Give us a bit of insight in kind of what that looks like from a consumer's point of view. I sign up, I want to work with my containers, I want to leverage Hedvig. I, I know that I've got a bunch of stuff in there that could be deduplicated, I know stuff that should be encrypted. Um, tell us about how some of those policies came about being and what they look like, what sort of flavors you have. Okay, so let me just talk about what a typical workflow would look like for an application yep. developer inside Kubernetes, right? So let's say you have a Kubernetes cluster running somewhere and let's say you have a Hedvig cluster running somewhere and they both are communicating with each other, yep. right? So as a storage administrator, all you have to do, so I'll talk about storage administrator yep. and I'll talk about application yep. developers, right? So as a storage administrator, all you would have to do is create what are called as storage classes. Yep. Think of these as templates that uh, define the attributes associated with the mm -hmm. volumes that mm -hmm. you create. So the storage class, the administrator would create storage classes, say, for example, uh, for this for storage class A, I'm going to create a block device and I'm going to enable encryption. Yep. For storage class B, I'm going to create a file share and I'm going to uh, enable uh, deduplication as well as completion, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Now, as application developers, you have your choices, right? You know what are the kind of applications you're developing. Yeah. You know what are the requirements from the underneath, from the storage underneath that your application yep. would need. So all you have to do is pick a storage class that your application would need and right. say, give right. me a volume, provision me a volume of, let's say, some terabytes from that particular Yep. storage class and and Hedwig will ensure that we will abide by those policies yeah. and we will give you exactly what you require right I and love it. once that is done application developers can continue to use focus as you said on application logic and not on what the underlying infrastructure provides so that's how simple it is yeah, yeah. Uh, from a solution point of view that's awesome so look, one last quick question if I can I mean you you know you're now part of uh, Convault You've got this broad ecosystem, an existing client base, uh, two decades or so of, 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 I guess, pedigree to draw on. Um, are there any areas you can sort of see, where, you know, I guess the question is where do we go from here? Leveraging what Commvault has already got on the table and obviously your own capabilities. Are there key things that you think that around the, the containerized 
uh, uh, workloads and challenges that people could sort of take away in action where they're like, well, we've got that workload, or we've got that, we're already a Commvault client, we should really now be looking at what Hedvig can do into that. Are there some things that people watching could take away and go, well, based on our existing environment in our enterprise or government one by being, we have Commvault, we're using your services, now that Hedvig's in there, what are some of the types of challenges around uh, containerization and particularly the Kubernetes-based workloads they've got that you think they should be looking at and going, well, now's the time for us to reach out to our Commvault partner and get Hedvig to the table to help us solve that problem. Are there any sort of examples that people could maybe take away and go, well, that's me, that's my problem, I should be talking to him? Yeah, so as Commvault customers and partners, so Commvault is very good at data management, mm. it's one of the best, right? As you have seen the Indeed. Gartner report already, uh, we are the world leaders. I can say we right now because yes, I'm a part of Yes, you Commvault, are we, absolutely. Right? So, yeah. So, uh, if there's a Commvault customer or partner who's actually, uh, who's actively looking to expand into the container ecosystem, yep. we are a natural fit there, okay. right? So that's that's what we provide already, right? Perfect, now, so you've got containers, it's a no-brainer, they need to reach out to you straight away. Yes, everything is ready for you, just yep. start using it as it is, yep. right? Uh, regarding other things, what we could potentially do, we are currently, we are we are discussing things, right? We are, we are discussing what is the realm of possibilities when it comes to yep. containers. So as I said, the world is gradually shifting towards running stateful applications in containers. Right. And uh, once virtual machines were the, were the mode of running applications, yeah, yeah. that's when, virtual machine backups came into the picture, yep. right? Now, as the world is slowly moving towards containers, I think uh, sooner than later, people are going to start uh, start talking about yep. what can we do with container backups, Indeed. right? So, and again, what how can Commvault help there, right? So, I guess I can see that people will gradually yeah. move towards that. And with containers specifically, we already provide a lot of capabilities beyond what I just spoke about. Yep. We do things like we can snapshot persistent volumes that the containers we use. Okay. We can clone uh, persistent mm -hmm. volumes that the containers use. So we already have those capabilities right. built in into Hedwig, yeah. right? So it's just a matter of now like, okay. exploring the realm of possibilities and see what we can do as the world moves towards containers. Seems to me like uh, if anyone's even remotely going to that space, which I think we all are at the end of the day, but with, with even without choice, because uh, almost everybody's refactoring the code and containerizing and making it cloud native for all the obvious reasons, seems to me that uh, sooner than later is probably the answer as to how soon they should reach out to a Commvault partner, integrator, or VAR, and get Hedvig to the table to just A, make them aware of what you can do for them, and B, get a strategy and roadmap of as to when they should start looking at doing trials and lab tests and, mm -hmm. and put you into the development environment to then go into production DR. Yeah. Um, well, definitely. So viewers, if you haven't already, do that. Reach out to your Commvault partner, your integrator, your VAR, your reseller, whomever, uh, and have a chat to them about getting Hedvig to the table and have a conversation about what you're doing around containerization and, uh, and the whole world of Kubernetes and orchestration uh, through the DevOps journey into production because uh, clearly there's a great uh, opportunity to, to do things in a smarter, leaner, keener way and also just stay on top of the current. Uh, we are happy to help out in any way possible because Perfect. we have all the tools Indeed for you, you guys have. to start your container journey. Well, congratulations on the, the successful so journey through the acquisition and uh, well done on this amazing event and I'm going to tune into your next uh, presentation down the end of the hall there yeah. and uh, I look forward to uh, keeping in touch in the next uh, 12 months and see where this goes and maybe we'll have the conversation again in a year yeah. and see what thank news has passed. Yeah. Thank, thank you very so much for your time, much. it's great to see you. Thank you so much, Des. it thank was you. very nice talking to Thanks you. Thanks a lot, yeah, cheers. Thank you.